Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am so excited to be here again with Ishtar Howell. And I have had him on previously for an interview. It must have been over a year ago now, I believe. And we talked about his near-death experience. So I will link that in the description so that you can become a little more familiar with his story if you're not already. So Ishtar is a meditation teacher, gardener, writer, and astrologer currently living in Portugal. Today, I've had him back on to talk about how to reconnect to that near-death experience consciousness state in this life. And he has a number of experiences that he is going to share that he had throughout his childhood and um, surrounding and preceding his near-death experience. And so we're going to get into that now. So thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you very much, Melissa. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. So I guess we'll start out. Maybe you could tell us about your experiences as a child and how you um, connected to that state. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, well, like where to begin? I think I'll begin in the crib, which, which was, of, of course, you know, I had my NDE at age 13. So anytime that I connected to these spaces before that, it's not like I was, uh, you know, had a sense that that I was going to be going to the same place, but I'll, I'll start in the crib. And I, I guess I, I didn't learn until I was 18 or 17. I was sitting in a, in an um, AP psychology class in high school. And I, I got to, we got to a certain point in the chapter on memory. It was basically, basically telling me that I, I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't have, or shouldn't have much confidence and a, a, a big chunk of, of memory territory um, up, up till age two, that, that had always been sort of part of, um, uh, you know, part of my sense of, of life history or where things came from. And uh, so I remember sitting in the crib. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it in there. And what, what would happen is, is I would just be sort of sitting, waking up before the sun came up. And there was just a sense of being in everything. There was a sense of, of, I knew where my body ended and, and objects began, that was clear. But at the same time, it, it, there was sort of this underlying, underlying sense of continuity. I could, I could sort of feel myself kind of flowing through a certain kind of medium. And the medium just, just kind of was, was in everything. So years later, uh, you know, not, not too many years later, when I, when I first saw Star Wars, um, with, with Alec Guinness on VHS. I was, I was born in the early 80s. And, he's, and he was kind of describing the force, you know, like it binds everything together and, and, and so on and so forth. Like, oh my God, you know, they're, 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 they're talking about that, that thing that I, that I used to know much better. Uh, and, and so I, I would kind of float around in that space. And I, I mentioned that because um, that I think it, that was the, one of the most important elements that later came about in both a near-death experience and a meditation path, which, which was basically spurred on by, by you know, having an NDE and having no idea how to get back to it. But um, in that space of all the, the other element of that, it wasn't just sort of a flat kind of medium. Anytime I would sort of put my attention more into it, which I, I, I enjoyed doing, um, there would be this this just delightful sort of feeling that would move up through my torso and kind of you know rise from the base of my spine basically at about the tailbone but sometimes my feet um, move up my body and then kind of flow out the top of my head and for many many years when even i was a little bit older and could walk and talk and all that sort of stuff that's kind of how i would go to bed at night is is you know basically doing these sorts of uh, breathing techniques, which you know, you know I don't know, not really a technique. It was just what was happening, in which I would breathe deeply into my belly, let everything go. I would have sort of a, a breath hold after my inhalation. I don't know why. I just liked it because it produced produced that sort of sensation of stuff coming up up out of my head. And then I would would breathe again. And then I would find myself when I was ready to go to bed, uh, floating out of the top of my head. 
Um, sometimes I would, you know, that would be it. And I would not be aware after that. Other times I was aware and I was actually going back out the top of my head, then through the, um, uh, the wall of my house and then, you know, out, out into the, um, the backyard um, by the old maple tree. And then I would go to, you know, God knows, God knows where all sorts of places. But as, as a kid, I, I basically figured I would must, I, that was dreaming or, you know, I, I didn't think I was, you know, going out of my body or anything like that. So I, which is probably be, which was probably good because then, then I didn't have to report it to adults, uh, you know, sort of to then be told, well, that's not possible. So I just kind of, you know, figured, oh, this is just a great way of dreaming, you know, and sometimes I'd go to these, uh, these kind of floating cities and I would learn things that, that they don't, you know, teach in earth school. Um, although I enjoyed, I enjoyed earth school, at least the academic aspect of it. They didn't teach you telepathy. They didn't teach you how to sort of, um, let your fears go. They didn't teach you how to, when, when, you know, something challenging happened, what happened in life. They didn't sort of teach you how to kind of erase that. And those were the, some of the sorts of things that were, uh, that was being taught in those kind of floating cities in the sky. So we're going pretty woo woo, really, really quick here with this, <laughs> with this interview. Uh, you, you know, the other, the other things that that sort of populated the early environment, which again, I, I think I was lucky that I basically interpreted a lot of it as, as imagination, even if I didn't really actually think it was imagination, I would just kind of say, oh, it's just an overactive imagination. We're the ghosts uh, and, and the spirits and, and whatever. Uh, whatever else was was happening that in fact the first one that I can remember very clearly and this must have been fairly early because it, it came before I learned how to um, walk and it came before I was really quite good at talking and before I learned how to escape from my crib on my own those were all those were all very big events at least the the, the, the crib escape and the, and the first time that I walked successfully but I was just sitting in the crib uh, one morning and then a lady came in the room I wasn't afraid of her at all. Um, she looked, in some ways, she looked like my grandma Louise, except my grandma Louise was about six feet tall, a very tall woman. And this lady was not that tall, but they had the same curly white hair. And, and this lady was wearing a, a blue nightgown with, with sort of a white lace pattern. She didn't look at me, which I felt was kind of peculiar because most people came to my room would look at, look at me. Uh, but, but she walked right by my crib but I could feel her attention, which, which I found was very interesting. I, I, I basically had the sensation of, of, oh, this person is, you know, somehow touching me in a way without, without touching me. So that was the first interesting thing that was different than most, um, most of the adults. It was, a, you know, it was a very strong beam of attention. And then she kept walking and I was watching her. I'm surprised I wasn't afraid. And then she walked right through the back wall of my bedroom. And... And that was, uh, you know, basically, I, again, I wasn't afraid, but I was super curious. And I thought, you know, when I figure out how to get, get myself out of this crib, I'm going to try that because I've never seen anybody, uh, you know, do that before. And, and so, you know, I think it was about three or four years later, I was looking at a picture book um, with my mom and, and, you know, turned a page and there was a lady with the white curly hair with the, with the blue nightgown and the white, white lace exactly as I'd seen it was, it was um, a, a picture of my great grandmother who, who died the year before I was born. So that was, that, that, that was probably one of the more, more benign and wholesome encounters. That, uh, then after that, I, you know, I was seeing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, basically what, what would happen is I would um, basically sit in my bed or I had this little tiny rocking chair and I would, I, I was into Sherlock Holmes at the time. And I think psychologically it, it helped me not be so afraid that I put myself in the role of a helper like, like Sherlock Holmes was. And I, I would view the people coming in my room as clients. And so I would sit in that chair. I'd, I'd, I had another chair set up across, you know, I'd say like, sit down, please, you, you know, and I would, you know, it's very, you know, I think the theater was, um, you know, helped my nerves and I would close my eyes and I would, I would go into this vast, vast space. And I don't know how I had no technique to do it. I just had the sense that's what I have to do when this happens. And I would go into this vast, lighter than, lighter than any light, 
space and I would, I would you know, ask it to project in front and ask it to help the person um, in front of me, you know, if, if, they're, if they're open to it. And, you know, nine times out of 10, when I would come out of that space or open my eyes, uh, they wouldn't be in there anymore. And there would be a very clean, very clean sort of um, feeling of the room. Because often when, when they would come in, emotionally, I felt, oh, this is a little bit jangly. You know, this is, you know, I was kind of sensitive to that. And I was actually very, at the time, I wasn't a slob. I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit messy now with, with my room. But at the time, I was very strange and very particular. It's like if someone moved my rug off the angle I had it on, I would like grab their trousers, because, you know, I was small and point at it. You know, and, 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 you know, then I put it back, you know, and I, you know, would show them the angles. Um, so, you know, when, when someone would come in, these spirits would come in, there'd all, be all sorts of sadness and a lot of, I think, adult emotions that I didn't quite understand, but kind of understood and hear. Mm -hmm. And, and so it was, it was night and day when, when those weren't there anymore. Uh, so that, wow. that, that proceeded for a while and, and kind of tapered off. Um, after about after about seven and eight, it kind of tapered off because that's when I went to school and and uh, you know you know learned the ABCs and you know, learned learned how to sort of think of myself as this abstract you know separate being and all all the a lot of the stuff that we need to learn, but it also of course then had the effect of of sort of dimming down a lot of the a, a lot of those uh, you know what we might call spiritual experiences. Right. Yeah. Another thing I personally found really interesting that I heard you say is that when you were really young in the crib, you could feel the difference between different types of materials. And mm -hmm. that stood out to me because I had forgotten most of this, but I, I really strongly as a child sensed the difference between different types of materials like plastics and things that weren't natural would actually make me feel sick in my body. So I <laughs> thought it was interesting that there's someone else who had a similar experience. Oh God, yeah, you too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow, oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, plastic was a shocker for me. I, yeah. I, I have to say a little bit. Um, uh, it, it didn't, um, it didn't make me sick, but it, it kind of made me turn my nose up. Mm -hmm. I think that's as far as it would go for me. I'd be like, oh God, what, you know, what are they doing here? And, and uh -huh. you know, that was, that was the, the end of it for me, but yeah. How old were you when you had your near death experience again? I was 13. Okay. And yeah. so after your experience, I know you talked about how you dealt with the grief of losing your mother at the same time as feeling this expanded consciousness opening up to you. Mm -hmm. And so what was your journey like from that point on? Most, mostly messy. <laughs> but I, you know, looking back and you know, not, not always so much in the time, looking back, it's very easy to see that. Um, not just in that period, but all, all the years before, uh, it, was, it was just basically um, the infinite God, whatever word you want to use for the great mystery, the you know the presence. Um, it was it was basically trying to open me up like a pickle jar, um, you know, for 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 many years, and and especially in that um, period after after the near death experience, after my mom died, I had a sweet kind of honeymoon maybe for for two or three months um in which i really didn't have any kind of clue what was what was out of frame what was happening to me um at, at first i thought it was just shock uh, because you know I'd, I'd heard about shock and i thought oh, well, these seem kind of similar but um once i started to experience all this bliss and joy uh you know, sort of spontaneous spontaneously welling up um, out of this very very interesting and and sense of silence uh, that that it was basically plugged into and while i don't think it was necessarily 24 7 it was you know most of the time uh to such an extent that i i often couldn't shake it if i wanted to and and i would sometimes try uh 
and maybe this is hard to explain, but I, I'd gotten used to having sort of a neurotic commentator, what I think of as neurotic, of the commentator voice in the head, you know, you judging yourself, talking about, you know, going back and forth. And, and then for that period after, after, the, uh, after the accident, uh, that really, if that was there, it was kind of like a person way up here. And yet there was all this vast uh, presence that was, that was uh, behind it. And, and so that, that was kind of this sort of dominant uh, space. And I could go back and forth. I could act out, which I, which I did. I mean, I, I was you know, punching the walls in my garage. I was, you know, uh, you know, as part of the grief, the anger part, all, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, being a teenager, laughing, having fun, of uh, you know, being kind of stupid. But at the same time, you know, behind all that was this this big reservoir. And and so the honeymoon period was was a was a connection to that space. And I had no idea how how much it had was having an effect until it faded away. Uh, when I went back to school and when it faded away, it was just rough, uh, rough, rough stuff. And, you know, I, I think I spent a year uh, in school kind of, I don't know, finishing out in some way, a lot of the old desire streams uh, that, I, that I'd had for the past six years. I, I think I fulfilled a lot, of, a lot of the stuff that I wanted to fulfill it all kind of happened. And then at the end of that school year, there was, in the summer break, there was just a sense, okay, maybe what was that place? What was that space before you know, that we were experiencing? And um, I started, you know, I, I do some crazy stuff like that I would never recommend to anybody, like um, jumping out of moving vehicles and, and, you know, kind of jumping from heights that frightened me because I thought that I needed to kind of convince my psychology that I was getting close to death in order to have something, you know, triggered on to get back into that space. Thank, thankfully, I didn't break any bones or uh, <laughs> I think I came close. And when I, when I came really close, I was like, okay, this is, this, you know, this is not a good idea. And I was really glad that, you know, my sister, my older sister has been a conduit for so many good things in my life. You know, a real, a real angel in, in my life, intentionally and often unintentionally, you know, but uh, you know, one time she wanted to go get some incense uh, at the metaphysical bookstore. And I never wanted to go inside a metaphysical bookstore. I'd look at like the, I don't know, like the, uh, the wind chimes and stuff that would be in the windows never attracted me. Uh, but, but I always would, you know, do what my sister wanted to do when we're hanging out. So I, I you know, followed her in, went in the back in the book section, opened up a book and it was started, it was just talking about the, the stuff that I'd been experiencing a year before and I was hooked. So, you know, that, that was, that was that yeah um, I, I, and I was like okay maybe that wasn't shock I mean it seemed to have I was in my head I was thinking yes that did have elements that weren't like classically part of most cases of shock the, the bliss the not, not being afraid of anything the the kind of high octane empathy mm -hmm. but kind of an empathy where I wasn't getting uh, uh, entangled in people's stuff mm -hmm. and I would feel into them because there was such a piece in the background that Oh, even if I could, I could sense that this adult in front of me had 40 years of unresolved heartache. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't pulling mm -hmm. me down um, into it too. So these were interesting things that I'd never ex really experienced that fully before in my life. And, and when I, I'm reading these books on Himalayan yogis and then later Christian mystics, and I just, I basically went through the whole store and I, and I had, <laughs> if, if Jason of Heart and Soul circa 1998 is, is listening, um, I, I <laughs> God bless you. Uh, for allowing me to, to read all those books. I, 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 in my head, I thought we had sort of what was called a tacit agreement, which was every, every now and then I needed to buy an amulet, you know, because I love the amulets. I would buy an amulet that, that I thought in my mind made it, uh, allowed me to go and read the books without <laughs> buying them. I don't know. I, I hope he was cool with it, but, but you know, it, it worked out really well. That makes me just want to ask you from your experience and all of your knowledge on this topic, and I think this is really what both of us wanted to really get to in this interview is how do you tune into that space? How do you, probably my language is all wrong here because there isn't. So really, is mine. Yeah. It, we're, we're, we're both going to be wrong together, I think. <laughs> but how, how, how can you become able to live from that space and connect with that space? 
well, of I think any way that, first of all, I mean, accidentally, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, that, that's, I think that's the wonderful thing is that, you know, in, in, in the pure sense, we don't need any method. In the practical sense, most of us do. I was in that big middle of the bell curve group that I would say really, really did. But I, I certainly had a lot of accidental wanderings uh, into that space. Uh, and and any anytime somebody, I would argue, and and you know, but anytime that anybody's experienced, you know, what what Maslow called the peak experience, we could say that they're either in that space or they're hovering a little bit above, but still in a wonderful, wonderful state. Uh, you know, I I would you know call the peak use words like um, the Sanskrit samadhi. Uh, you know, as maybe the deepest sort of possible peak experience state or, or the Christian tradition has a wonderful um, uh, phrase that the peace that passes all understanding. Um, to me, these are, these are tantamount with each other. They're, they're, the, they're, they're pointing at the same sort of ineffable, uh, ineffable universal experience. So first accidents, but then of course, if you wanna, you know, like not get so damn frustrated waiting for the next accident. Uh, any, I find that anything that, that relaxes your nervous system uh, you know, to a kind of a fundamental level. Uh, so, you know, in my case, it was meditation. And there's a lot of different kinds of meditation. I think a lot of different kinds that could all work uh, just as well for any given person uh, or, or maybe work at different times in their life. So I'm, I'm, I'm not in, a, uh, in any way a sh chauvinistic about, um, you know, any practice for anybody. And in my case, I... Did a, tried a lot, and I was doing the old uh, everything and the kitchen sink approach, uh, you know. But <laughs> which I kind of think is good if you do that and you're really passionate about it. I do think that eventually, uh, grace or or the the intelligence of the universe probably will will kind of guide you to the to your sweet spot, to your real sweet spot. But I, you know, I put myself through some hell with concentration, meditation, and yoga, and getting up at three in the morning and. And, and, you know, um, Zen meditation. And, you know, I had a lot of good teachers strangely come through my little Midwest town teaching different methods and workshops. And I went and I took the ones that resonated. Eventually I, I came to, you know, there, there's maybe two meditations that have, in my case, and might not be in everybody's case, affected me more, more profoundly than anyone else. And one is this thing called the Ashaya's Ascension. Uh, meditation, which became my primary practice, and another, uh, you know, which was trying to come into my life, but I, I felt like, oh, it's not quite right, but thank you, was, was transcendental meditation. And, and funnily enough, later, I, I found out that the two had a lot of things in common uh, with each other, mainly that they're effortless, and, and also that the, the person who founded this ascension practice uh, basically came out of the TM movement and had been a teacher of it for, for 20 years. But the thing that both of these uh, technologies are is uh, they are basically mantras, and and the and in this case the idea with the mantra is is you're not using it to sort of shut the mind up, uh, and that, that maybe that's fit more than fifty percent of the beauty of these practices uh, is that the idea of these meditations are, are not to tame the monkey mind or beat it into submission or chain it up or, or there, there's no need to uh, spend years developing kind of concentration abilities if you think you don't have them. That's not at all part of, of these things. Rather, the idea is, is that we're, we're feeding this monkey mind ideal bananas, uh, that, that uh, the, and the, these mantras, you know, basically charm this monkey and kind of take it to its, I don't know, paradisical realm of infinite bananas, <laughs> put it like, like that. And th that's, you know, exactly what I, what I found the effect to be. I used to, I remember so many times I'd, I'd sit down but with previous techniques for like supposed to be a 20 minute sit. Right. And I was very good about doing that. And like, I'm, I said, okay, I gotta look at my wash, you know, see how far I am. It was like 45 seconds. And I'd be like, Oh my God, I couldn't even make it to a minute with, without, uh, and, and when I, you know, I did uh, say the, this ascension practice for the, for the first time, it was like, good God, y you know, it's, uh, I, I couldn't believe how easy it was for me to um, relax and, and, and stay still and, and um, you know, kind of bask in it. And well, I found that also interesting because at the time I just read 
uh, Paramahansa Yogananda's wonderful autobiography of a yogi, which you know has been one of those books that turns so many people in, onto uh, the spiritual path in general and uh, yogic practices in particular. And at the time, I was I would I think I was favoring Sanskrit as oh like this is a special language, you, you know. And I was and you know that that sometimes I had a, it, it went together with a bias I had that oh if you think these special languages it's basically like like magic and that these these will take you somehow to uh, you know this uh, original boundless consciousness more effective than other things. But then I, I learned this ascension practice and there was short sentences with praise, gratitude, and love involved in them. It was, I wasn't raised in a, in a Christian setting, but it almost, it, it had a, a kind of a Christian feel to it, except very different uh, in, in context than, than what, you know, there was there's no praying to, you know, do this, do that, nothing like that. It's, it's just appreciation, gratitude, love, and these little phrases and, and in English. And I was so skeptical. So thinking, oh, this can't work. Because English is a mongrel language. Nothing sacred can come out of being, you know, Shakespeare, uh, notwithstanding, or all the other beautiful poets in, in English. But I thought, no. And so that was that. Was that. It, was, it was really uh, uh, basically love at first sight, love, love at first um, practice. And, you know, later I, I also played with, uh, you know, basically doing transcendental meditation, uh, but with another name. And for me, that had a, a very similar, um, but not exact effect. So uh, I really think that for me, and this is a bias, uh, you know, but uh, I think if you do anything wholeheartedly vis-a-vis uh, -vis spiritual practices, if, if you, and, and just don't worry, just put your heart into it, pick a, um, you know, pick an amount of time to sit every day. This is very old fashioned. Not everyone quite likes it. I totally understand. But if you have something that's reasonably pleasing to you, like as, as a practice and, and is actually profoundly relaxing. And, and if you just pick, you know, uh, pick a, pick a regimen and stick to it for a while, you'll, you'll have wonderful results. And at least you'll have something. And I think this could be really helpful for a lot of people because so many people tell me that they just can't meditate. And I think yes. it's because people are trying so hard to get their mind to be quiet. And it's just, yes, it's a never, it's a losing battle unless you have hours and hours and hours to sit and do it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a wonderful thing I, I, I'll, I'll say here because it dovetails. But I remember like the first 40 seconds of actually doing my current practice in the class. I'm sitting there in the chair. The teachers have just told me some instructions that were completely counterintuitive to what I, how, how I thought one should go about meditating. You know, they're telling me, oh, just don't, don't try to do anything with your thoughts. Just, um, you know, let them, you know, they can roam as much as they want. Just every now and then come in and sort of very lightly drop, drop this seed thought into the mind. And I was like, okay. And I was, you know, even talking to myself, like, okay, okay I'm, I'm going to just let these thoughts be uh, right here. Fine. Okay. I'll just do what they say. I don't think this is going to work. And, you know, that was you know, part of the chatter. And then all of a sudden I realized, wait, it, it felt as if, okay, whoa, this is different there. I have, it's like being at the bottom of a swimming pool or something like that. I somehow without really knowing what was going on until I, you know, I hit the bottom, I found myself this great reservoir of silence. And at the same time, being able to experience these these thoughts kind of glistening what, on what was now kind of a surface way up there. And I realized, oh my God, this is not, this does not have to be a, a, an exercise in escaping something or getting rid of something. This is actually more of an exercise in relaxing to the point where we experience a fuller spectrum than what we normally experience. We're stretching the spectrum and, and, and just simply taking up all the space. And that's what what shifts what on a larger scale that's what shifts things around because we don't have to we don't have to try to kill our ego we don't have to spend years trying to remodel our personality and get rid of our foibles that 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 to me is actually putting the cart before the horse uh, you know the, there's actually use in some of those things but if that's our main approach i think it's 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 um you know makes sisyphus feel feel like he's he's having a good you know day at the office or um, yes, something like that. So how has this affected your life since you discovered this type of meditation? Oh, God. Uh, well, I can sort of remember that a lot of my day-to-day -day experience was, was dominated by this kind of neurotic, 
the sort of tension of neurotic thought. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's just miles away. Uh, that's been miles away for a very long time. Uh, I, I even remember like some of the thoughts that I sort of like my, my, that I disliked the most that would repeat were, were all kind of variations on, um, you know, I suck, I, you know, I, I got to do that better. I didn't do that well enough. You know, like the, these, these people don't love me. They don't like me, uh, you know, and a lot of those weren't even particularly linguistic. They were, they were just kind of needling mm -hmm. down there and you just feel them in the body. And yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was a big chunk. I was spending a lot of time on, on that and a lot of just stuff from childhood, you know, c conditioning from childhood, you know, I, ways, um, ways that I was holding myself that I'd become deeply unconscious of. And, and you know, a lot of repressed emotion uh, was part of my experience up to um, 18, 19, you know, 20, especially, uh, which is the years I started practice. But uh, I'm eight, when I was 18, I think I had, it was as if, I, you know, I had a, an un, unbeknownst to me, like a barrel of anger, you know, that was, you know, down in my guts and, and boom, you, you know, it, it, it just came, it was coming out. It was sweating out. Uh, I, and, and for maybe a month, I felt like I was probably like, like an angry crocodile, you know, uh, but thankfully most, for the, you know, maybe not for the most part, you know, um, maybe 50, 50, uh, you know, with, with the meditation practice, I was able to just let the feelings move through the body. And it was as if I had this kind of, uh, like not a dissociated place, but kind of a place where I could just sit and be like, okay, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sweating anger right now. And, and, uh, but I don't have to fight it and I don't have to run from it. I can just feel it. Uh, you know, I, because I, I was being starting to be connected more and more with, you know, a part of the self, which is greater than, than everything. Uh, it, you know, I, I felt I had to repress these things because they, they frightened me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was young, they, they frightened me because I was mainly identified as this kind of little, I think a wonderful word for it is, is the biographical self. And that was the, the center and what I thought for, for many years, the totality of who I was, this kind of person who was born then, is going to die someday, who has all these likes and dislikes, you know, stops and ends at this body. Uh, and once I started really kind of consistently dipping into something vaster than that, then, then that changed so many equations in ways that you, you don't even have to work out. So that, that changing, and, and with that drop of tension, there's just been such an increase in love. I mean, just, mm -hmm. I, I think that to me, that <laughs> that's, that's the uh, chocolate yeah. cake here yeah. that, that really keeps you going because, you know, the, the, the silence is so like, like a balm. Uh, and that sense of just pr a profound peace. But the, out of that is this just kind of juicier um, fullness of, in the heart. And that, that's, that's been more and more, I think, e each year for, um, you know, years and years now growing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard for me to even uh, verbalize or even think about, you know, all the ramifications that's had. But and suffice to say, it's just, it, it, it makes the world alive. And it breaks the, it's part of the, it, it's broken down a lot of boundaries that I had no idea, perceptual boundaries that I had mm -hmm. no idea were boundaries. Like, again, the sense of, you know, being this biographical self with, you know, there's other people over there, there's objects, you know, there's a automobiles and birds, but this love has opened up the, again, this thing that I had in my childhood, but wasn't, you know, conscious of what it was or why, or that it's important or something, but opened up that sense of, oh my God, you know, the, the, this kind of sense of wholeness that that's very difficult to describe in words, but everybody has experienced a few times, you know, especially when yeah. even even in, in limited sort of waking state identified with your little box person consciousness, when people are in love, even if it's limited love, but if they're really in love, there'll be moments, this is why the people love it, there'll be moments when it's like that tension disappears. The, 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 you know, the, the neurotic persona is miles away. It's like we've given ourselves permission just for a few of those seconds in a sea of limitation. We've, we've been given permission to, to allow ourselves to bloom as our unbounded selves. That, that to me is important too, because I, I basically find that I, I, I mean, one of the ways I, I saw it even just post NDE when I was really raw is I would basically look at people and I would see like, 
I would start to cry of joy, but sadness too, because I would be seeing these angels in people and be like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. But you're, you're, you're like, you're really hurting yourself. You're straight jacking yourself. And it hurts. It hurts me if I, you know, it, there's pain to, to feel it. This is so, uh, this kind of leads me to another thing why, you know, people get kind of obsessed with fixated on thinking they need to destroy some part of themselves that's no good. It's you know, the mm. ego or something like that. Um, now, now it just needs to be put into a different context. It just needs to kind of soften, soften into, into, its, into the vastness that's, that's behind. And, and then the funny thing is that as people go into that vastness, they don't, they don't you know, become, I don't know, like vanilla personalities. You know, it's uh, they don't become, oh, I'm going to speak in a monotone voice or something like that, or I'm just going to speak in this gentle voice and, you know, sit by orchids or something. Uh, I, I, th I think, you know, with, with, when the straight jacket's taken off, they, they can actually inhabit the song that's been wanting to sing through them, you know, the, the whole time. The, uh, what I say on a deeper level, the aspect of, of God, uh, to put it in those terms, that everybody is, is trying to express itself and then we can we can sort of become that you know that 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 ain't that hundred foot tall angel that's been kind of uh, you know folded into a into a little package kind of like the genie in a ladder i suppose it's actually you know quite a quite similar yeah metaphor oh. thank you so much for sharing all of that it's very um, inspiring and encouraging to me and i know i'm going to go check out this meditation that you're talking about if I'm hmm. sure there will be other people who would like to as well. So could you share with us where they can find out more about it and where they can find out more about you? Okay. Well, uh, my, my humble little corner of, of the internet and this, and this beautiful meditation practice can be found at uh, my website, which, which is uh, www.ascension-meditation.com. And, and, or you you can also look up, um, Ishtar Howell, if you want to see my, my ridiculous, I don't know, Instagram page that has absolutely nothing to do with spiritual teaching and more, more to do with, you know, you know, juices and plants in Portugal, you know, you know, you know, feel free, but I'm all over uh, social media as well. Thank you. Yes, I will put your links in the description. And is there anything else that you would like to say or that we haven't covered before we go? Oh, God. Well, you, you've, I, I mean, I don't know, actually, there's so much bursting out of my heart. Thank you for, for doing this. I, I feel, um, you know, sort of a kinship um, with, with you and, and your heart. Yeah, me too. I, maybe there, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end, you know, this, this discussion that I'm now having with many people that I don't even see. Uh, but, you know, obviously, you don't have to believe this. And even if in belief or disbelief doesn't matter, but you are love. You, you are love. That that's this is this is the conclusion. One of the conclusions that all this, all this meditation and yoga and you know whatever else has has basically borne out is it's like you, you don't have to love yourself or be loved or at the end of the day you know when we rest enough into our into the stillness you know in, into the silence that's that's there already that that's what we we learn we learn that this is just this is just love. Beautiful. Thank you so much for doing this, Ishtar. This has been um, long awaited and much needed. And I will, <laughs> I'm going to share your previous interview. I'll pin that on my channel so that people can watch it right before I post this interview. So, oh, thank you. Yeah. So and, thank and you. I'll send you, uh, I'll send you the link. To, I also work as a, a messy haired astrologer to a very different oh, that's right. line of work. Yeah, so I remember that we'll, we'll last. put that in there, in there too, I suppose, if people want to hear this um, about the songs of their soul and you know, what, what's, what's, what's trying to jailbreak if, if there's a jailbreak. Oh, needed. wonderful. So.